We'll start off uh, with uh, Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, Karen Donfried, then turn to the Assistant Administrator for Europe and Eurasia, Aaron McKee, then the Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs, Jessica Lewis, and then our Ambassador at Large for Global Criminal Justice, uh, Ms. Van Schack. Secretary Donfried. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, Senator Portman, Senator Barrasso, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the United States' response to Russia's premeditated and unprovoked attack on Ukraine. The bipartisan support of members of this committee and the majority of Congress for Ukraine is extraordinary. The work we are doing with your vital help is enabling Ukraine to achieve victories on the battlefield, relieve human suffering, advance justice and accountability, support economic stability and energy security, and intensify international pressure on the Kremlin to end this unconscionable war. When it comes to Russia's devastating war against Ukraine, the values and interests of the United States are clear. We are doing everything we can to help Ukraine defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity. We are demonstrating the strength of our convictions by leading the global response to ensure Putin's unlawful and immoral war of choice results in a strategic failure for Russia. The American people and our government have made clear to the world that we will not allow President Putin and his enablers to continue these atrocities and their aggression with impunity. Against this threat to regional security, global stability, and our shared values, we are supporting freedom, democracy, and the rules-based order that make our own security and prosperity and that of the world possible. The danger Russia poses to Europe today, including to its own people who value freedom, has not been felt so starkly since the days of the Soviet Union and the Cold War. Yet the determination and coordination of our allies and partners in response has been just as impressive, fueled by the resolve and bravery of Ukrainians. With your support, we have accomplished a great deal. First, we have strengthened Ukraine. We continue to provide Ukraine the military, economic, and humanitarian support that it needs. Since Russia's February 24, 2022 invasion of Ukraine, we have sent more than $3.8 billion in security assistance, and our allies have stepped up too. We are providing increasingly sophisticated and modern Western equipment that the Ukrainian military has assimilated with professionalism. We have committed a billion dollars in direct budget support to bolster Ukraine's economy, maintain government services, and rally our allies and partners to fund and plan for Ukraine's reconstruction. And we've provided $688 million in life-saving assistance for civilians in need within Ukraine and the refugees in the neighboring countries. Second, we have imposed serious costs on Russia for its brutal war against Ukraine. We have put in place sanctions, export controls, and other economic measures that are targeting Russia's ability to finance its war machine. President Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine has made Russia an international pariah. The actions we have taken in coordination with those of our allies and partners have isolated Russia as never before on the world stage. Our unity of purpose also shows we and the international community will not go back to business as usual while Moscow continues its brutal assault on Ukraine. Ukrainians are fighting valiantly and they are using the support we are providing to great effect. They are fighting for their liberty, for their right to exist as a free country. Yet success is still precarious. Russia continues to inflict suffering and devastation on Ukraine and its people and tries to break our resolve with threats and intimidation. This is a crucial time for keeping concerted pressure on Russia to ensure Ukraine has the strongest possible position 
on the battlefield and eventually at the negotiating table. Now is the time to stand with Ukraine. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Secretary Donfried, I, I strongly believe that Ukraine must define what <clears throat> winning this war looks like and must drive any terms of disengagement or a secession of hostilities. But clearly the timeline on which this war is being fought seems to have been elongated. So is that view the State Department's uh, position in terms of uh, how we define winning in this respect? Chairman Menendez, thank you very much for that question. And yes, the view of the State Department is the same as yours, which is Ukraine will define what winning this war means. And we are committed to supporting Ukraine so that it can prevail in this conflict. And the tremendous bipartisan support we have in Congress for the assistance we've been giving, whether that's security assistance, economic assistance, humanitarian assistance, puts us in an extremely strong position to stay the course, as you say, as it looks like this war quite tragically may grind on for some time still to come. Now, one thing that concerns me is that the more the successful the Ukrainians are on the battlefield, the greater the risk that Putin will do something uh, uh, that would be outside of any international norm, something rather terrible to escalate the crisis. Uh, he may feel like he has to do something uh, along the lines of a chemical, biological, or tactical nuclear weapon. Does the administration share that concern? We are planning for all scenarios, and certainly we are thinking through what does happen if Putin were to suffer conventional losses, what might that lead him to do in terms of the kinds of weapons he could use. It is something we are talking about within the administration. It's also something we are talking through with our allies and partners as well, because certainly we would want to have a unified response. There are many scenarios out there, and I'm not sure it's helpful to go into specific hypotheticals, but I can assure you that that is something we are taking seriously and will do our best to be In prepared addition for. to the potential responses that might be had along with our allies, if he makes such a grave mistake, uh, are we also thinking of ways uh, to decrease the likelihood for Russia to demonstrate its uh, capabilities? As you've seen, the administration has gotten out in front of several possible scenarios in suggesting that Russia may be making plans to, for example, use chemical weapons and calling that out in advance. On the nuclear front, President Biden has been very clear in talking about the special responsibility Russia and the U.S. carry given our status as nuclear powers and the need to be responsible not only in our actions but also in our rhetoric. And certainly we will continue to be very focused on trying to preempt any of those scenarios from playing out in real time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your steadfast uh, support of Ukraine and, and specifically your work over the years on the human rights issues and now the issue of war crimes. Um, and I couldn't agree with you more. We need to ensure that the international Criminal Court uh, takes this as seriously as the Ukrainian prosecutors are. They um, handed down their first indictment this week, I saw, uh, and there are so many instances as we're seeing constantly again last night uh, on video, seeing uh, clear war crimes being committed. Uh, so I, I, I appreciate the work all of these uh, public servants are doing every day. Uh, you all are waking up every morning, I know, with the thought in mind that America's role here is to help Ukraine win. And I want to talk a little about uh, how we define victory. Uh, when Secretary Austin uh, said after meeting with President Zelensky that we can win this war against Russia, uh, this happened a few weeks ago, I thought that was positive. Uh, on Monday, uh, the Foreign Minister uh, of Ukraine, who all of us have had a chance to, to visit with, said, of course, the victory for us in this war will be liberation of the rest of the territory. So Assistant Secretary Donfried, first, just a yes or no, do you believe Ukraine can win this war? Yes. And how would you define victory? Would you define victory as requiring the return of all Ukraine's sovereign territory, including that that the Russians seized in 2014? 
Well, Senator Portman, thank you for that question and thank you for your engagement on these issues. Your question very much relates to where Chairman Menendez began, which is, are we in a position of believing that it is Ukraine that should be defining what winning means? And I agreed with, with Chairman Menendez's statement on that, and that is where the administration is. We believe Ukraine should define what victory means, and our policy is trying to ensure Ukraine's success, both by so, assisting so you, so the administration's Ukraine official position is that Russia. victory is uh, getting Crimea back and, and getting the Donetsk and Luhansk region back as well. Again, I believe that is for the Ukrainians to define. Uh, with regard to energy, which is, I think, our number one problem with regard to sanctions, unbelievably, uh, Europe still sends roughly, we are told, $870 million a day back to Russia in terms of energy receipts, uh, funding the Putin war machine. Um, I spoke to some of our European friends this week when they were in town for a, a Munich Security Conference type meeting. And um, I understand that we now have some arrangement with Europe through a task force where we're looking at making the switch from uh, this dependency on Russia to other sources of fuel. But it's going very slowly, in my view. And uh, I know it's easier for us uh, to have made our decision than it is for the Europeans. We were sending about $50 million a day, by the way, to the Russians um, for the uh, oil and gas that we have now sh uh, shut off coming to the United States. But I'd like to know two things. One, what is this task force with the EU doing? Uh, in one of the statements, it mentions a work plan that the task force is following. What, what progress have they made to date in actually reducing reliance on Russian energy? And can you describe in more detail the, this task force work plan that was mentioned? Senator Portman, I couldn't agree with you more that energy is a key factor in Europe's response to Russia's war against Ukraine. And you're right, the dependence of many of our European allies and partners is far, far greater than what the US had. Some of these countries are 100% dependent on Russia for their energy supplies. And that was the reason why President Biden and President von der Leyen on the EU side set up a task force. So what, so what has the task force done? That's so, my question. Well, the task force is trying to help the Europeans think about what are alternate supplies if and as they wean themselves off Russian energy. Okay. You've seen the Europeans ban Russian coal. They are now working That, that will be on as of August, so they haven't banned it yet. Uh, right. They're still spending money uh, on, on coal, and natural gas is the, is the largest single one. So it's starting to get them to think about, I mean, I just think it's got to be <laughs> people are dying on the battlefield. Civilians are dying. And we continue to fund this war machine through these enormous uh, amounts of funds going back because of energy. The, the, the answer, obviously, from the U.S. point of view is to provide them an alternative. And I've been critical, as you know, that the Biden administration has not done more to enhance our own production here, particularly with regard to natural gas that can be liquefied and sent to Europe there. Um, this last week, they had a record number of imports coming in to Europe uh, through their own ports, bringing in uh, LNG, liquefied, nat uh, liquefied natural gas. Uh, but I would hope that we would expand um, our production here quickly and stop the policies that, that are stifling the, the production, particularly of natural gas, and help with regard to the, the infrastructure that's needed. And l let the Europeans know that we're going to be there for them, um, because we have the ability in this country to be able to provide that, as well as encouraging our allies, particularly in the Mideast, to do so. so I hope that's what will happen. Uh, with regard to NATO aspirations, I hope we will also continue to say that we believe that, that this is something that Ukraine should aspire to. Uh, and I'll further questions uh, for the record for you, Mr. Secretary Lewis, with regard to the drawdown authority and how long it will last. But thank you very much for your service. And Mr. Chairman, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, I understand your urgency, and we share that sense of urgency. Thank you. And Secretary Godfrey, um, are we making it very clear to uh, Russia, that we do not want to pose an existential threat to them, that our only goal is to restore the territorial integrity uh, of Ukraine? We are making it very clear to Russia that this is not 
a conflict between Russia and the United States. We are not going to engage directly in this war. President Biden has been explicit in saying we are not sending U.S. troops to fight in this war. So I do believe we have made that clear. Our goal here is to end a war, not to <clears throat> enlarge it. Yeah, obviously, we don't want a nuclear conflict, uh, and Putin is saber-rattling. Doesn't it make sense for the U.S. just to say flat out, we will not uh, be um, the country that engages in a, few, a first use of nuclear weapons in, um, in Ukraine, just so that uh, the whole world knows and, um, uh, and Russia knows as well that that will not be something that we will engage in, that, that a no first use policy of uh, the use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine is what uh, our policy is and will continue to be. Again, I would say the U.S. has been clear that we are not looking to engage in this war and that NATO is a defensive alliance. I think that increasingly people in our country but around the world are afraid that this could escalate um, and that nuclear weapons may be involved. So from my perspective, I just think it would be wise for our country just to say flat out, we will not use nuclear weapons if nuclear weapons have not been used against Ukraine or the United States. That would be, yeah, that would be my uh, uh, position. And, and I would also hope that, at least on the side, um, that conversations could be engaged in um, with regard to nuclear weapons deployment between US and Russia. I know it's difficult in this context but I do believe that it is something that has to be at least contemplated, if not um, uh, not actually possible in this context. But have you thought about that to ensure that those kinds of discussions are taking place? Again, I want to be clear, the U.S. is not a party to this conflict. It is Russia that undertook a full-scale invasion of its neighbor, its sovereign neighbor, Ukraine. The United States is providing security assistance and weapons to Ukraine, but there's no question of the United States providing nuclear weapons to Ukraine. So, so I, I, you know, in my mind, it's very clear the United States is not a direct party to this conflict and will be not sending troops or using its own weapons in this. Yeah, it's just I'm increasingly concerned, I think a lot of people are as well, that talk of doomsday machines just brings us back to Dr. Strangelove. Uh, in uh, the 1962 movie, the exact same language, and uh, and that's when, you know, irrational conduct becomes contemplated, and unfortunately uh, could be engaged in. So I just would hope that any possible conversations or communications uh, are made. I, I would prefer to be public in terms of no first use. But and I do think you've seen the administration be very clear that it believes any talk on the Russian side about the use of nuclear weapons is irresponsible, and that we, the United States and Russia, have a particular responsibility as nuclear powers in how we talk about the use of those weapons. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Thank you. Rich. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I, I'm going to pick up where you left off there. Uh, th this talk of nuclear weapons is, uh, uh, is uh, something that needs to be undertaken very, very cautiously. Words matter. Uh, it, it, it is not the policy of the United States at this time to declare a no first use uh, of nuclear weapons. We have what's called strategic ambiguity in that regard. Uh, our uh, allies uh, have uh, joined with us in, in that particular policy. I share uh, uh, Senator Markey's uh, concern about irrational conduct. Uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, us that have control over the irrational conduct. We've seen probably about as an irrational a conduct as possible uh, when the decision was made to, uh, to go into Ukraine. Um, one, uh, and, and they continue to talk irrationally, particularly about the uh, use of nuclear weapons. Uh, that's, it, it's, uh, uh, as uh, the Secretary said, as the President has said, uh, that is irresponsible uh, discussion. It, it, they're irresponsible comments, and they ought to come off at the table. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have control of that. So, uh, but we need to keep uh, we need to keep pressing people that uh, when you talk like that, it, it is it is grossly grossly uh, irresponsible. Uh, Secretary Donfried, um, well, in fact, if, if any one of the four of you, I wrote a couple of weeks ago uh, concerning. Uh, 
the expansion of NATO. And uh, we have, uh, we, the United States, have always been the last one to vote for accession to a, for a new country. Um, I, I want to reverse that this time. Uh, we're about to get two new members, and uh, I, I've encouraged them, and lots of other members of Congress have encouraged them. Um, in talking with uh, the, the, the Finnish uh, people and the, uh, and the Swedish before this whole thing started, they were already having, uh, they were already having uh, a real uh, uh, concerns about the decisions they've made to try to remain neutral. And uh, they were already thinking that, uh, that they needed to belong to a defensive organization. And we need to underscore over and over and over again, NATO is a defensive organization. It is not an offensive organization. And it's not going to attack anyone. It's not going to uh, take any kind of offensive conduct. Having said that, it is the strongest defensive uh, organization in the world made up of 30, soon to be 32 members, uh, who will defend every square inch of every piece of land in all 32 countries. Russia needs to understand this, and uh, I think they do. I, I think that uh, Putin's already uh, made the calculation that he can't, uh, he, he can't uh, do anything with these, with these countries. If he did, uh, the Baltics would already be gone, I think. So... Uh, we want to continue to underscore that. Um, I look forward to welcoming uh, uh, Finland and, and Sweden. I think if you lived in that country, you'd take one look at what happened in Ukraine and say, look, we have no choice. Uh, we have got to get into NATO uh, and, prov and provide this uh, ourselves uh, with a, a joint defense with all these other countries. Because if we don't, uh, who knows w w uh, what's going to happen. I, I think all of us have misjudged uh, uh, the way things were going in Europe over the last decades, uh, it looked like perhaps Russia was slowly, very slowly, moving to a response, being a responsible player on the international stage, and in one uh, fell swoop, and uh, uh, they they changed that, and uh, we're kind of back to where we started from, and we all need to uh, need to toughen up and uh, and strengthen our eastern flank, and uh, and and we're going to do that. So, and I, I think they're coming. So ha have. What can you tell me about uh, the, the paperwork on these takes long, I know. And that's why I wrote and said, let's get started. Anybody tell me anything about whether you, whether you got my letter to begin with and uh, whether we're doing some preparation? Well, Senator Risch, very grateful for your engagement on this. As you know, the administration strongly supports NATO's open door policy. And in fact, a principle that we are defending in Russia's war against Ukraine is the right of every sovereign country to make its own decisions about its security and foreign policy. So I think this issue is fundamental in this conflict. And in the case of Finland and Sweden, these obviously are very close and valued defense partners of the United States. As you know, they already have a partnership relationship to NATO. They're both key EU allies. And I am so struck in reflecting on where Finland and Sweden are today in terms of their relationship with NATO, that this is another piece of the mounting evidence of what a strategic failure Putin is suffering today. You know, if we think, take Finland, you know, if we think about how carefully Finland has managed its relationship with Russia over time. Finland has an 830 mile border with Russia. And if you had asked me at my confirmation hearing, do you think Finland and Sweden will apply for NATO membership during your 10 years as assistant secretary? I would have said no. But we saw Finland move immediately after Russia's full scale invasion on February 24 because it changed the security situation fundamentally. So I am struck by how so much of what Putin says he was seeking to avoid, he has brought about. And I think Finland and Sweden's interest in NATO is a key example of that. So thank you for your engagement and for the question. Yeah, uh, well said. And uh, I, I think that uh, uh, truly what, what uh, uh, Putin did in, in invading the Ukraine and the reaction to it by Finland uh, and for that matter, Sweden underscores the stupidity 
uh, of what he did in uh, just uh, getting the exact opposite uh, of what he wanted. And I, I was also struck by how quickly things moved. Uh, I, I talked with, uh, with both of them prior to it, and the, the polling in that country was iffy as to whether they should or not. The polling today is, is skyrocketed, and, and for a very good reason. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Coons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. Um, thank you uh, to our witnesses testifying today. I'm just going to follow up on that line of questioning. Um, Assistant, uh, Assistant Secretary Donfried and uh, Lewis, if you could just give me a simple, concise answer. Um, I've met recently with foreign ministers uh, and leaders from both Finland and Sweden. Um, they are really pressing for a, a bridge security guarantee from the United States, uh, which the United Kingdom has just provided, so that in a period that they see as a period of potential risk or instability from when they apply for NATO accession to when uh, all the NATO uh, partner nations finally ratify uh, their accession, they're looking for an explicit guarantee. Is this something you recommend? Is it something you think the administration will be announcing or undertaking soon? Senator Coons, thanks very much for the question. You're right, we saw the British uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson extend I understand. security assurances Yes yesterday. or no, please. Uh, what, what I want to get to is what you mean by security guarantee. We've been clear that there's no Article 5 guarantee right, before a country joins NATO, so we will surely find ways to assure Finland and Sweden, but what the nature of that would be is still to be worked out. Do we have a lot of time to work that out? I think you're aware there's a NATO foreign ministerial I'm well aware. where both Finland and Sweden foreign ministers will be there, and I'm certain this yep. will be a topic of conversation. Thank you. I'm, I'm told the silos are full. So th that's kind of step one. Let's empty those silos, okay? And then, you know, har harvest the wheat. But I, again, I would, I would say the first step is to make this a really big issue publicly. Be raising it. I, I, you know, I don't hear everything the administration says, but I have not heard the administration really raise this and, and put this out as a top priority. Senator Johnson, I want to assure you the administration feels your sense of urgency. The United States has the presidency of the UN Security Council this month of May. And next week, Secretary Blinken will be spending two days in New York, one for a ministerial on food security and the other for a UN Security Council conversation on this. So the United States is using its presidency of the UNSC this month to put a spotlight on the issue and galvanize international support around this to the specific logistics issue, which you're absolutely right on. We have to date been sending that Ukrainian grain out through the port of Constanta and the concern is whether we can continue to do that because there may be other grain shipments from Serbia and Hungary coming into that port. So there's a question about whether we can increase the capacity there. Are there other ports on the Black Sea like Varna that we can use? The port of Odessa is part of the conversation. So there we are very actively and urgently focused on this mission. So I want to assure you that, yes, we share your concern and we are trying to put a spotlight on it. I, I, would, just, I would just do it more publicly. Final question. Do you have any initial estimates of the cost of rebuilding? You know, we're, we're talking about a $40 billion uh, aid package right now. Uh, I think the American public, I think the world needs to understand the economic devastation. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming the way it gets paid for is eventually on some reasonable royalty on oil and gas. You know, Russia gets less than what they hope for. The people who use oil and gas will you know, obviously be picking up the tab, but would any idea, just make people aware of how much this is gonna to cost to rebuild Ukraine. Oh, my crystal ball is cloudy because we don't know when the war ends. I understand, but what's the devastation so far? I mean, again, the human toll is incalculable. Yeah, I, I just... We're talking hundreds of billions at least, right? I, I, do, I have no idea. What I do know is there's one person on this planet who can end this war right. today, and that's Vladimir Putin. Thank you. And I know we all call on him to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Secretary Donfrey, did, did you want to reply? I think, actually, since Secretary Lewis was referring to Ambassador von Schack, but I would say that the fact that we have created this position at state, which Ambassador von Schack is... is um, filling shows the critical priority we give to this. And I couldn't agree with you more. This isn't just about Ukraine. These are crimes against humanity. And we are working, it actually gets back to the start of your comment too about the staying power to continue 
working closely with our allies and partners. And I think this issue of accountability is one that absolutely unites us. And we collectively are working to gather the evidence that will allow us to hold Russia accountable for these crimes. Thank you. Senator Ross. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Donford, I wanted to follow up a little bit on what Senator Portman had talked about, which was uh, Russia's willingness to use aggressively energy as a weapon. Mm -hmm. And um, we continue to see Russians threaten our allies, our partners with natural gas, other things that they, they do. What, what additional actions should we be taking in the United States to stop Russia from using its energy resource to coerce and to manipulate um, our, our allies in all of this efforts and to, fund, and to fund Putin's machine? So let me start by saying that I want to make sure we all appreciate the profound impact of February 24 on our European allies and partners. I think the prevailing view in Europe had been that there was a codependence with Russia, that they were importing fossil fuels from Russia, but Russia needed their the revenues from that. And I had a European colleague say to me, Karen, do you understand February 24 is essentially Europe's 9-11, that this is fundamentally changed how we view Russia across all sectors, including energy. And the fact that we've seen the EU move on coal, and yes, that won't hit until August, that we are likely to see movement on an oil ban in the coming weeks. We see how contentious this is within the EU because some countries are 100% dependent on Russia. And then you that still leaves gas. Um, and I think our role here is to help Europeans find other supplies. And this is where US LNG plays a critical role. We're seeing a country like Germany make plans to build two LNG terminals. That'll take a little while, but they're moving in that direction. We also then have to look at the interconnectors that go from those LNG terminals in Europe to countries that don't have terminals that aren't on the coast. So I think we're clear about what the action plan is and it is supporting our European allies and partners to as quickly as possible implement that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. So your question is related to an essential part of the strategy, which is how do we impose costs on Russia and prevent them from influencing in a very negative way our allies and partners? So there are various elements of that strategy. Surely one is sanctions. And there, I don't think we appreciate enough the magnitude of the sanctions we put in place against Russia. It's an order of magnitude different than what we did in 2014. We've never put sanctions on the central bank, for example, of a G20 country. And Russia has been artificially inflating the value of the ruble, so I don't think we have a clear read on the impact that has had, but I believe it's profound. We've seen over 600 private sector companies leave Russia, and those are not short-term decisions. They're not going back anytime soon. On the export controls, those are having a clear impact in terms of our ability to degrade Russia's defense industry. So I think if you look across the range of costs we're imposing, on Russia, it is affecting those different sectors that you highlighted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to see you all. Um, uh, Secretary uh, Lewis and Secretary Donfrey, I'm going to talk to you on the record about a few of the things that we were discussing uh, before the hearing began. Um, uh, Secretary Donfrey, uh, yesterday, uh, the relatively new prime minister of Bulgaria was in town, and of course, this is a nation on the front lines of this crisis, almost entirely dependent on Russian energy, uh, now cut off from that supply. If Bulgaria survives this moment, if this government survives this moment, it's a really important sign to Russia that um, they are going to be unsuccessful in the future in trying to use energy as a mechanism to, to bully neighboring nations. Um, there are you know, a handful of things we can do um, there may be some creative financing mechanisms we can engage in. We can also um, you know, try to shed light on the pretty massive profits that the private energy companies are making right now. There certainly is an ability for those companies to be able to do some kind of temporary discount uh, for nations that are facing these crises. Um, but I, I wanted you to just talk for a minute about uh, the importance of supporting our friends in Bulgaria and the importance of 
um, you know, making sure that we have the right tool set available to help other nations that are going to be in a set of dominoes pretty soon, Greece maybe next, uh, that are going to need help from Europe and the United States to figure out this problem of Russian cutoff. So I want to be clear. The administration is all in on supporting Bulgaria here. As you referenced, Russia made the decision to cut Poland and Bulgaria off of gas supplies. Poland was already moving in terms of weaning itself off of Russian energy. So Poland can manage this relatively well. Bulgaria is much more vulnerable. And I think you saw the strong support for Bulgaria when the prime minister was here. The national security advisor met with him, the secretary of state met with him, and then he also had an opportunity to meet the vice president. And I have colleagues who are working literally every day with Prime Minister Petkov on helping Bulgaria think through how does it manage this cutoff from Russia and how can we help them make sure they have the supplies. I, I, I just hope that everybody in the administration hears this as a priority and is ready to be nimble um, and quick uh, because this is a present crisis uh, and there's lots of reasons for us to decide that our bureaucracy isn't properly set up to help them, in particular our development financing arms, but let's find a way to get to yes. I, I want to, Senator Coons asked about the Port of Odessa and with respect to food and um, other supplies going in and out, but I, I want to broaden that to the entire Black Sea region because I did a hearing before the European Affairs Subcommittee last year on Black Sea security, and what we heard there was that we should be thinking about a broader strategy to push back on how Russia has engaged in the Black Sea. This was before the war in Ukraine. So can you talk about how we're thinking about the Black Sea region right now, the, the potential impact on security, not just for Ukraine, but for the other countries that border the Black Sea, and, and how we're gonna wrest control away from Russia over the Black Sea? Senator Xi, maybe I can start on that. Thank Please. you very much for the question, and it is highly relevant. You're right, it was relevant before February 24, but it's only taken on greater urgency since. And I think the immediate response we've seen within NATO is the decision to create four new battle groups in Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Slovakia. So we had had the four battle groups in the north, in the Baltics and Poland, because the focus very much had been on the northern flank. And now we're looking at the entirety of NATO's eastern flank, so north and south. So the first thing is the battle groups, and then the conversation that's play taking place in NATO right now in the run-up to the Madrid summit at the end of June is what should NATO's force posture look like going forward? And again, that conversation is ongoing now among allies, but there will be decisions made and then announcements in Madrid in late June about what NATO's force posture will look like going forward. And there's no question in my mind that the importance of how we posture ourselves in NATO southeast along the Black Sea is a critical piece of the force posture question going and, forward. And do you want to talk about Turkey's role right now in the Black Sea? Because I understand that they have been playing a more positive role. Turkey is a critical strategic ally along the Black Sea, always has been. And of course, Turkey is welcoming this focus on buttressing security on the Black Sea. And in the case of Russia's brutal war against Ukraine, Turkey has been engaged in terms of providing assistance to Ukraine, also providing a platform for some of the diplomacy around trying to end the war. So yes, I do think Turkey is playing an important and helpful role. And in the Black Sea? And in the Black Sea, of course. I mean, Turkey, speak to the Black Sea? Um, well, yes. You know, in terms of enforcing the Montreux Convention, Turkey has played a very helpful role. So yes, I do think Turkey in all of those areas is proving itself to be a key helpful and strategic ally to the U.S. Thank you. I know we're talking about Ukraine, but you have just returned from the Western Balkans, and one concern that I have is that that's a potential breeding ground for Russian meddling. Can you speak to what you saw while you were there and 
concerns that you have and what sh we should be thinking about in terms of really staying focused on what's happening in the Western Balkans? Well, Senator Shaheen, let me just start by thanking you, thanking Senator Murphy, thanking Senator Tillis for the time and attention you've devoted to the Western Balkans. You had traveled there right before I had, and I very much benefited from the conversations we had both before and after my trip. And I think the Western Balkans, it's always been important, but it's an example of how Russia's war against Ukraine is affecting the entire continent. And Russia has long played a complicated role in the Western Balkans. And it is a place where US engagement and diplomatic presence really matters. And it was very important to me to go in the wake of February 24 to make it clear to all six countries of the Western Balkans that we, the United States, are paying attention and that we want to help them move forward on their path to Euro-Atlantic integration. And there are different challenges in each of these countries, but it is a place where American diplomatic muscle can make a difference. And the fact that you were part of a bipartisan delegation there also underscore that this is not only the Biden administration, but in fact, that Congress in a bipartisan fashion is focused and engaged on that region. Thank you, I appreciate that. This is probably in Secretary Donfried's space. Are you involved in sort of interagency discussions about how we backstop Ukraine and our European allies? You know, we're asking them to cancel Russian imports, stop Nord Stream 2. Is the State Department involved in a significant interagency discussion about that? Yes, we are. And is that you that's involved in those discussions? I am not the one leading those discussions. There is a Bureau of Energy and Natural Resources at State that is in the lead together with Amos Hochstein, who is our special yep. representative on energy. So those are the two leading those conversations at State and literally having those conversations every day, not only with the countries affected like Ukraine, but also with our partners in the European Union who are playing a critical role here as well. Well, well let me tell you why I'm so puzzled about what's going on in this space. And, and you can take this back to Mr. Hochstein and others. Um, Senator Murphy was talking about the fact that we're not getting cooperation out of our Gulf allies that we might want in terms of more energy supply to Europe. But Senator Barrasso pointed out today, President Biden announces that he's canceling a massive uh, oil sale and lease in the Cook Inlet in Alaska. Um, we also have American energy companies that could produce a lot more energy, and they're not, maybe for their own reasons, by producing less, they keep the price up. But I don't see coordinated action on behalf of the United States and using the Defense Production Act or others to make them do that. Um, I, I get the reason for the cancellation announced today was concerns about climate. That's the, that's the reason. And we ought to be concerned about climate. But it strikes me, if we're the largest energy producer in the world, and we know that at least transitionally our European allies need energy from sources other than Russia, that us going to Saudi Arabia and say, please produce more energy when we're not willing to do it ourselves, I just don't get it. I, th I think, I, I don't know that there's a coherent strategy, and if there is, I think the messages are mixed. I mean, I, I would be curious whether the announcement of the Biden administration today about, the, about this massive cancellation in Alaska, was that discussed in this interagency? The interagency should be discussing Ukrainian energy need, European energy need, high gas prices in the United States, climate, which affects all of us, Ukraine and Europe. But, but I get the feeling that there's sort of a left-hand, right-hand problem, and that some of the administration is really concerned, as they should be, about climate, and some of the inter administration is really concerned about trying to backstop our European allies on energy, but I don't really see meaningful coordination, and if there is, I'm sure not getting messages that suggest that there is. And so I guess that what I would like you, Secretary Donfrey, to take back to Mr. Hochstein and the administration is, I, I think we need to see from the administration sort of a diplomatic plan. If we're telling the Europeans, get off Russian energy, you're too dependent on Russian energy, well, what are we telling them to do? Beg the Saudis? Well, the Saudis are saying no. Um, and then the Europeans are looking at us and we've got, we've got supply that we could use, at least transitionally, 
that we're apparently not willing to use. Now, I will say this Cook Inlet cancellation, if that had been granted, it wouldn't be producing energy for some time. So it's not like that would drop gas prices tomorrow. But there's a mixed message. And I, I, I don't really believe that the U.S. is full-throated leaning into helping our European allies deal with their energy needs. And, and in fact, if they were looking at what we were doing, we're asking the Saudis to help them, but we're leaving our own assets that could be used to help them sort of strand, stranded right now. So I don't know if you have a comment on my mm -hmm. puzzlement. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like you to take that back to the State Department. I'd like to see a lot more coherence from the administration on this, but if you have a comment, I'd be very welcome to it. Sure. Well, Senator, I, I am very happy to take that back. And it was kind that you started with compliments and totally appropriate that you have critiques as well. And we certainly can benefit from, from your thinking on this. Uh, you know, I, I want to be clear that it's not just the U.S. saying to the Europeans, you need to wean yourselves off Russian energies. That is a belief the Europeans themselves hold. So I think there's a synergy there between the perspectives. And I think the hope in the administration is that there's a way to marry the climate concerns with the energy security needs. And I think if you look at some of the new technology, like the small modular nuclear reactors that, for example, Romania is pursuing with us, that there are some real opportunities to, in fact, marry those two goals of climate and energy security. Uh, certainly, the administration, in releasing strategic petroleum reserve oil from the strategic petroleum reserve is an effort also to enhance supply that's out there but i'm happy to take this back and share it with my colleagues and i will note that the president has nominated a, an assistant secretary for the bureau of enr environment and natural resources and it is jeff pyatt who just stepped down as our ambassador to greece so i will commend the committee for looking expeditiously at that nomination and giving us even more muscle on these energy issues at the State Department. So thank you. My question uh, to you, and I don't know, maybe, Ambassador Donfried, this is best for you, is it uh, the administration's intention to process this as quickly as possible with our other NATO partners? And uh, when can we expect uh, to see a submission to the United States Senate for approval? So we right now are waiting on Finland and Sweden to officially apply for NATO membership. And our expectation based on the news today and, and other things is that that is likely to happen very quickly. And as you know, throughout, we have strongly supported NATO's open door policy. And in fact, an underlying principle that we have been defending in standing up to Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine is the right of every sovereign country to determine its own foreign and security policy. And in Finland and Sweden, we have two close and valued defense partners. Uh, so certainly this is going to be a topic of conversation at the NATO Foreign Ministerial this weekend, where both the Finnish and Swedish foreign ministers will be there. And I know there's been bipartisan support in Congress uh, on this issue. So I, I mentioned earlier, I think you may not have been here, that what strikes me really quite intensely as I reflect on where Finland and Sweden are is the extent to which this underscores the strategic failure Putin is suffering. Yes, no, there's, there's no doubt about it. I think so it underscores um, yeah. the miscalculation. Um, just uh, on that point, uh, well, beyond the NATO point, but a lot of our defense partners, as you know, we've been more and more successfully urging them to supply Ukraine with weapons. Uh, they need to have their supplies backfilled, uh, sometimes with replacements, sometimes with the next generation, more modern um, U.S. systems. Uh, I, I hope uh, we're really pushing hard. I don't have time to get into details, but just um, th that is something we continue to hear about, um, not lack of desire, but uh, the bureaucratic levers moving too slowly in that process. Uh, obviously, part of our approach uh, is providing Ukraine with weapons. Uh, the other is the set of economic sanctions, uh, including, as has been discussed here, the efforts uh, to um, wean some of our partners off of their dependence on Russian oil and gas. Um, we have a headline yesterday about the EU's efforts uh, to adopt a, a Russian oil embargo being spoiled by Hungary. My question um, to you, uh, Ambassador Donfried, what are we doing about Hungary using our bilateral relationship? I mean, they are right now holding up a decision by the European Union that's uh, a critical part of our overall strategy. Um, what are we doing about it? 
Well, thank you, Senator Holland. First, just on your first point about backfilling, I can assure you, Assistant Secretary Lewis wakes up every morning and goes to sleep every All night right. thinking this about is... backfilling allies. And I'll just give, I think the S-300 case in Slovakia is a great example where the Slovaks had a capability very useful to the Ukrainians, and we were able to provide a Patriot battery to give that protection of their capital, Bratislava, so they could then in turn pass that system. Can always do better, but I do want to commend the work of my colleagues on that front. Uh, and then to your second question on the EU oil ban, so in many ways this is a question for the EU. My assessment no, of no, what's I, happening- I, With all respect, I'm asking using our bilateral so, so, relationship with Hungary, what are we doing to tell them this is unacceptable to be standing in the way? So what I was going to say is my understanding of what's happening right now is that Hungary is negotiating for a longer period of time to wean itself off Russian oil. And that is the deal that they are working at in the EU. So I, I am still rather optimistic that the EU will arrive at this, if not this week next. I think we're actually very close to seeing the EU put in place that oil ban. Okay. Um, so the, the good news here in Congress is we seem to be on the verge of passing the $40 billion emergency assistance uh, bill. Uh, that includes uh, $5 billion for uh, food assistance to address food insecurity around the world. I, I want to second the comments many of my, um, my colleagues have made with respect to the urgent need to free the grain out of uh, the ports of Odessa and Black Sea. I know that's easier said than done. Here's the thing I want to emphasize. I don't think that we collectively and, uh, have done a good enough job of telling the world that rising food prices and rising food insecurity and rising hunger is a part of a deliberate strategy of Vladimir Putin. Uh, we continue to hear from you know, people that, that Putin is being successful in trying to you know, persuade people in sub-Saharan Africa that somehow this is our fault when he's killing people in Ukraine and he's killing more and more people around the world in days to come through food insecurity. And we need to really up our game in terms of explaining to folks around the world, and I've, I've been looking at that list of folks uh, in that original UN vote, the 35 abstentions and those that didn't vote, a, a lot of them are suffering, their people are suffering uh, because of uh, rising food prices. We're seeing it around the world, we're seeing it here. It seems to me that I would hope that in a couple weeks, if we were to, for example, have another vote at the UN hypothetically, can we get some of these 35 abstentions to vote to condemn based on what's happening? So I'm not sure if you're channeling Secretary Blinken or he's channeling you, <laughs> but he is very focused on exactly the way you frame this issue, that we need to make clear to the world who is responsible for this, and it is Vladimir Putin and this unprovoked war that he has started in Ukraine. And that is why Secretary Blinken wants to use this month's UN Security Council presidency, which the US inhabits, to focus on food security. And next week, there will be the ministerial meeting in New York, and there'll also be the UN Security Council uh, discussion of this. And it gets to your point that when you look at those UN General Assembly votes, whether it's those who abstained, the 141 who voted for that initial resolution to condemn Russia's war and demand that Russia withdraw, that we both want to hold that coalition together and move folks from that abstention column over. And Secretary Blinken completely agrees that food security is a critical piece of this because so much of the developing world is suffering from food insecurity. So, yes, happy Vladimir Putin could change the situation today. Right. Yep. If he uh, just agreed to open up, uh, help us open up those ports. Yep. Thank you. Um, but as we know, he's also um, successfully put up uh, a, a sort of the Iron Curtain uh, to prevent uh, facts and information, true information from reaching the Russian people. There are reports and there are lots of very ingenious people working to try to overcome uh, that sort of, uh, you know, Internet Iron Curtain. Any evidence that we are breaking through more, that the truth is breaking through more to the Russian people? Have, have we seen any evidence of that? Unfortunately, I do not think we are seeing evidence of that, and that is not for lack of effort. 
there are a lot of very smart people who focus on press and on public diplomacy who've been trying to think, how can we get this message into Russia? And to your point, there was a sense that having ever more body bags return to Russia was one way that message would get through to Russian mothers and Russian fathers. Uh, but it's hard to know how reliable the public opinion statistics are that we are seeing coming out of Russia, but we're just not seeing any significant change uh, in public opinion in Russia. And I think it suggests how very effectively Vladimir Putin is controlling the narrative in country. I mean, I think in the longer term, we are going to see the impact of the sanctions and export controls on the Russian public. I just think that's not a short-term impact because the sanctions, their effect will compound over time and Russian citizens will feel that. And certainly also with the over 600 private sector companies that have left the country, they're also going to be feeling that. So I do think over time the impact does compound and we will see it affect Russian citizens more than it is right now. But I don't see that as a short-term uh, effect. Thank you.